All right, we're going to the book of Luke. I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I don't know what it is. But it'll probably occur to me some random point here in the near future, and I'll interrupt my sermon to bring it to you. But meantime, uh, we're going to Luke chapter 11. This decade, we're studying the book of Luke, and we're up to chapter 11. Uh, and we're here hovering for a while on the Lord's Prayer. In fact, all of, or most of Luke 11 is about prayer. Jesus is telling us about prayer. And I'm thinking about entitling this series, however long it's going to be, uh, something like Rethinking Prayer. Because what we're going to see is that a lot of our fundamental assumptions about prayer get called into question, if we let them get called into question, as we study Luke chapter 11. We're here looking at the Lord's Prayer, and I want to entitle this message this morning, uh, Talking to Dad. Talking to Dad, and I'll talk for a half hour or so, and then we're going to get into another time of, of worship. But that's really what prayer is all about, is it's just talking to our heavenly dad. And so here's how it goes down in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, and I'm reading from the TNIV version. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us, teach us to pray, just like John taught his disciples. Jesus says, sure, here's, here's how it goes. When you pray, say... Father, hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. The Lord's Prayer. Let's pray for a moment here over this message. Lord, I thank you for every person who's in this auditorium right now, or every person who will be coming into this auditorium as the sermon progresses. And for every, everyone who's listening through iPod, all of our pod uh, God, I thank you for everyone who's tuned in right now. And I pray, God, that you would open up all of our minds and our hearts to receive your word, to make us people, influence us to be people who talk to you continually, naturally, and powerfully, and who trust that our talking to you does more to change the world than anything else we could possibly do. Create that confidence in us, Lord God, that radical kingdom confidence in the power of prayer. And use this message to do it. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 The disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Let's start by looking at a little clip from uh, one of the funniest movies ever made. I'm sure it's one of your favorites. For a lot of you anyways, it's called Meet the Parents. Here's a little clip. Wow, Dina, everything looks fabulous. Well, I'll tell you something, it's such a treat for me to have a home-cooked meal like this. Dinner at my house usually consisted of everybody in the kitchen fighting over containers of Chinese food. Oh, you poor thing. What, there wasn't enough food to go around, Greg? No, there was. We just never really sat down like family like this. Oh. Greg, would you like to say grace? Oh, uh, well, uh, Greg's Jewish dad. You know that. You're telling me Jews don't pray, honey? Unless you have some objection. No, 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 no. No, I'd love to. Pam, come on. It's not like I'm a rabbi or something. I can <laughs> say grace at many a dinner table. It's... Okay. Oh, dear God. Thank you. You are such a good God to us, a, a kind and gentle and accommodating God. And we thank you, O oh sweet, sweet Lord of hosts, for the smorgasbord you have so aptly lain at our table this day and each day by day. Day by day, by day. Oh, dear Lord, three things we pray. To love thee more dearly, to see thee more clearly, to follow thee more nearly, day by day, by day. Amen. Amen. Oh, Greg, that was lovely. Thank you, Greg. That was interesting, too. 
day by day. Oh, Lord, three things we pray. You can feel the guy's pain. You can just feel his pain. It's so awkward. The minute he gets asked to pray, he goes, starts to go into a religious verbiage. I've prayed at many a table. Who talks like that? Who talks like that? But see, for, I think for a lot of us, especially public prayer, but sometimes even private prayer, it's kind of awkward. And I think the reason it's awkward is because we've been taught that it's something, it's something religious. Uh, there's a special language you're supposed to use. It's supposed to be profound. It's supposed to be insightful. Uh, you know, and, and there's a certain posture you got to use. There's a certain way you got to hold your hands. And if you're not in on that, if you weren't raised in that, you don't quite know what to do. And for a lot of people, in public prayer or private prayer, it, it just feels weird. It feels unnatural. It feels painful. And you can feel the pain of that. Prayer becomes, in a lot of circles, in fact, usually a sort of a performance. You're going to the Almighty God, and so there's a certain kind of language you got to use and a posture you got to assume. Now, I don't know where we get this, because you don't find it in the Bible. You certainly don't find it in the New Testament. Uh, wh- who, who came up with the rule that when you pray, you're supposed to fold your hands? I was always taught that. Fold it like this, make a cross with your thumbs. Any, any of you taught that? That's how you pray. Now, that's not in the Bible, but somewhere along the line, it just kind of got attached to the idea of prayer. There's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. And a certain language you got to use. In some places, there's a certain tone of voice. Dear God, you know, <laughs> you who reigneth on high. You know, and there's kind of this ambiance you're supposed to have. It's a real kind of spiritual prayer and it's supposed to be insightful. Uh, something as simple as closing our eyes. Who t- where do we find in the Bible that you have to close your eyes when you pray? Now, there's nothing wrong with closing your eyes and there's nothing wrong with folding your hands. But, but there's kind of a rule that you're supposed to close your eyes. Who came up with that rule? Uh, I personally like to ordinary pray, pray with my eyes open. It just feels more real. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with closing your eyes, but it becomes a rule. It's like what you're supposed to do. And there's even a kind of a prayer posture you're supposed to assume. You know, when, when someone says, let us pray, we all assume our prayer posture. <laughs> 25, 40, what? No, it's, it's head down, you know, and, and there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. We got our own religious verbiage. Here's, here's something that's just kind of arisen in the last decade or so. And this is neither right nor wrong. I'm not like, you know, th- th- this is fine. I'm just observing how we use a special kind of language when we pray. When people pray now, we almost always use the word just about a million times. <laughs> now, we didn't used to do that. It's, I don't know how it evolved, but yeah, you, you hear this prayer like, Lord, I just want to thank you. I, I just want to say you're such a good God. I just want to pray for Aunt Martha and, and just want to ask you to touch Timothy. And I just want to bless these food. And I just, 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 and it's like we're begging God. I'm not asking too much, God. I, I just, I'm only asking this much. Okay, can you throw me a crumb here? I'm just going to ask this. When the Bible says that he's able to do exceedingly more and abundantly, a- more than we ask or even imagine asking. But we're up here going, can, can we just, can we just, can we just, like a little kid going, Dad, can I just have a cookie? Can I just have a tootsie roll? Can I just, you know, go to the state fair? Just, just, just. I was at Bethel one time, and the Bethel students pray like this all the time, just, just, just. It's kind of like they say the word like, uh, or they used to. I don't know how they talk now, but like, it, they, they use the word like all the time when they talk to one another. It's like totally, like I just thought like totally, you know, awesome, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> well, when they pray, they use the word just, 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 just. There's one girl in chapel who prayed, God bless her soul, and I obviously was pagan and not joining in the prayer because I was doing a sociological experiment counting how many times she said just. In the span of two minutes and 20 seconds, she said just 18 times. I just want to, I just, and we just, and we just, 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 just. It's biblical justice. Uh, I don't know where that came from. That was really weird. But see, the, the point is that we have a special kind of language that we use. And if you're not in on that language, it begins to feel weird. It begins, it, it can feel artificial. Now, in some religious traditions, you solve this by telling people exactly what they're, they're supposed to pray. You got the rote prayer, and you know exactly when to pray it, and it takes away the awkwardness if you know the prayer. So when I was growing up, it was always, you know, I knew that when you sat down to eat, some of you had the same prayer, I bet, uh, we, we just folded our hands, bowed our head, closed our eyes, and it's, bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Done. It's just really simple. Now, I had no idea what a bounty was. Uh, I, I, in fact, I, I thought as a little kid, I, when my dad took me, one of my first movies ever was Mutiny on the Bounty. <laughs> and so I thought the bounty was a ship. And so God's got some kind of a ship. Honestly, he's got a ship up there. Throw us some goodies from the ship or something. I don't know how they got from the ship to us, but we're supposed to thank him from his bounty. A lot of things like Lord of Hosts. I, I never knew what that meant. 
Uh, but I knew that in my Catholic upbringing, the host was a little wafer, you know, that you give a communion. So I thought it was the Lord of a lot of wafers. <laughs> it makes sense. I see, I, I was screwed up the theologically from a very young age. And, and I, I could blame all my present mistakes probably on that fact. But we knew what to pray. You know, you go to confessional, they give you the Hail Marys. I love that because I could whip off Hail Marys so fast. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. No, but Holy Mary, Mother God, pray for sinners now at the, other, at, at the hour of our death. Amen. I just screwed it up. <laughs> but I didn't know what the, womb of the, the fruit of her womb was. <laughs> that, you know, but it doesn't matter. You, you know, that's the prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed is the Lord of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother God, pray for sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, God, death. Amen. And if I got assigned 10 of those after confession, boom, I'm out of there in, in, in 18 seconds. <laughs> But we had the prayer, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, for I have sinned, I sinned against thee, O Lord. Can we, we've got some Catholics in the crowd here. You know what I'm talking about. And, of course, there's always the, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> you, you just go through those rosaries like it's nobody's business, man. Yeah. Smoking rosaries. And there's a place. There's a place, I think there's a place for liturgical prayer and written out prayers and memorized prayers. I'm not against that. In fact, this prayer is intended to be a, a group prayer. But see, if that's all you do, then it becomes just sort of a pro forma activity. It just becomes, th there's no relationship in that. Uh, it, it, there, there's, there's no real relationality in that. What's interesting is this, I find this really interesting, is that the early disciples, the Jewish disciples, they were raised Orthodox Jews in the first century, which means they were taught how to pray. They had a list of prayers. Every morning you get up, first thing you do is you recite the Shema Israel, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And there, there's prayers that you pray in certain occasions at certain times and, and in certain circumstances. They knew how to pray the traditional prayer. And yet here, in this passage, we find them saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. They're confessing, you know, I don't think we know how to pray. And it must have been something about the ministry of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, the, the new view of God that he was giving them, and the new view of the kingdom that he was giving. And we've seen throughout the book of Luke that, that, that in, in the ministry of Jesus and in the teachings of Jesus, everything gets turned on its head. All, everything that you thought was normal, religiously speaking, turns out to be wrong. Everything that you thought was wrong turns out to be normal in the kingdom. The inside People are on the inside, or find themselves on the outside. The outsiders are in, and everything is, is turned upside down. So these disciples here, I think, are going, okay, Jesus, you pray different than we're used to, and you have a different theology than we're used to. Will you teach us how to pray? And I think that humble attitude is a beautiful attitude. That's why I want to possibly title this series, Rethinking Prayer. Because I want us to get to the point where you just say, okay, Lord, teach us how to pray. Let, let's forget for a moment everything we think we know about prayer and get rid of all the religious baggage and start from scratch. Lord, teach us how to pray. And this passage that we're looking at right now is the only time where the Lord specifically gives us words and direct concepts about how we're to pray. And so I want to study this. The first thing that really jumps out, our youth pastor, Seth, pointed this out in our little weekly meeting as we're talking about this concept this week. He goes, he was impressed by how short the prayer is. It's a short prayer, isn't it? Teach us how to pray. Okay, boom, 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 boom. There you go. Just do that. That's fine. There's no frills. There's no pompous language. There's no religious verbiage. It's just a straightforward, natural-sounding prayer. Father, boom, done. Just say Father. You don't, it doesn't have to be this almighty supreme being on hither yonder ethereal transcendent planes. No, just, just Father will do. Father will do. Uh, you know... Hallowed be your name. Lord, you're holy. That, boom, done. It doesn't have to be, Lord, we magnify your omni-attributes, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnibenevolent one. No, it's just, Lord, you're holy. That, that does it. Thy kingdom come. Boom, done. It doesn't have to be, Lord, who worketh in mysterious ways, we know not how, for your ways are not our ways. We ask you to intercede in the hearts of those who are darkened. No, it just, Lord, bring a kingdom. It's a simple, straightforward, non-pompous, ordinary language kind of prayer. And that already, I think, tells us something. It tells us something, I think, profound, very, very important. And that is that prayer should be natural. It should be natural. It should be as natural as talking to your best friend. 
Because as a matter of fact, God is your best friend. You may not know that yet, but he is your best friend, and he's always with you. And it's natural to talk to your best friend at times when they're with you and to use natural language, ordinary language, in order to do it. Prayer should be as natural as talking to your best friend. It should be as nat- it's a natural part of, 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 of our world, not a separate religious thing, not a, not a thing that we use separate language for. It doesn't have to be a prolonged, extravagant, profound, insightful thing. It's just talking, talking to dad. Lord, will you just anoint, will you just, look at that, see? <laughs> Lord, I, I'm just begging you to just anoint this message. No, just, Lord, Lord, anoint this message. Yeah, that was a prayer. God bless that person. That's a prayer. God, give me insight. There, there's a prayer. It doesn't be long. doesn't be, Father, uh, Father, just strengthen my voice. There's a prayer. Give me your wisdom, Lord. There's a prayer. See, it, it, he's right here. He's not far off. This isn't a long-distance phone call. And, and, and you're not being disrespectful when you just use ordinary language. He's the one who tells us this. A lady talked to me after the service, uh, in, in, in the first service, and said that she feels guilty when she talks ordinary to God uh, because, you know, he's so supreme and so majestic and so out there. And he is supreme and majestic and, and transcendent. But he tells us he's, a, he, he's our best friend, and he wants us to talk to him like a best friend. And it's to be an ordinary part of our, uh, uh, of our life. Now, there's a, a time for separate prayer, and we need that. A, uh, a disciplined time where you, every day, set aside to talk to God. And, and maybe just have God talk to you, and you romance God, or do intercession with God, and, and, and have times where he just pours his love on you. We all need that. And there's times to go on retreats where all you do is pray. Those separate times are important. But it's also vitally important, following the pattern of the prayer that we're given here, vitally important, that we... Make prayer an ordinary part of our life, to integrate it into everything else that we do. You're watching the news. You see a tragedy. You say, Lord, bless this family that's in trouble. You're reading the, new, you're reading the newspaper and, and you hear about a tragedy or a problem. Just use some of the authority that you have as a kingdom person to change the world through the power of prayer. And you say, God, bless this lady. God, bless this man. Lord, bless this family. Bring comfort to this person who must be grieving right now. You hear an ambulance outside. It's the time to utter a prayer. God, whoever's in trouble, whatever's going on right now, touch them, heal them, restore them in Jesus' name. You can pray anytime and at all times. When you're in the shower, good time to pray. You're driving on the road, good time to talk to dad. Uh, you're doing some household chores, great time to talk to dad. You're going grocery shopping. Look, at if you're with your spouse, you talk to your spouse sometimes, don't you, when you're grocery shopping? Why not talk to God? And I'm not saying talk out loud because people might think you're loony and lock you up and then you won't be able to come to church and that'll be a bad thing. <laughs> you don't have to say it real out loud. But if someone notices that you're moving your lips and thinks you're weird, so what? Yeah, sometimes we're called to be weird. But to, to, God's always there. He's right here, closer to you than your own skin. And he wants us to talk to him, to cultivate a conversation with God that goes on uh, throughout the day. Sometimes if you're open to it, you'll just be driving and someone will pop in your mind, a need will pop in your mind, a problem will pop in your mind. It's a good time to pray, to talk to God about that person, about that problem, about that marriage, whatever the issue might be. In fact, if you're open to it, the Holy Spirit will put stuff on your heart. It says in Romans 8 that when we don't know what we should pray for, God makes intercession. The Holy Spirit makes intercession, and he'll put on our heart what God wants us to talk to him about. And, and so when something pops in your mind, you just utter a couple words for it. And you just say, Lord, bless that person, bless that marriage, bless that situation. And it may feel weird at first if you're not used to it. We're so used to doing life in our own head, life in a secular mode. We live life as, pretty much as functional atheists, where we don't integrate an awareness of God and a conversation with God in most of what we do. We keep it a separate compartmentalized religious thing that we do on Sunday and maybe for 10 minutes in the morning or 10 minutes at night. Uh, but see, we need to, to kingdomize our life, to bring the kingdom to every area of our life, which is the goal. To make every area, every moment of our life a dome in which God is king. To do that, we need to remain aware of God's presence and talk to God, have a conversation with God in ordinary language. He's your best friend. He's right there. And you'll find that if you do this, it changes things fundamentally in your life. One of the things that will change is this. God will start to become more real to you. If you'll just talk to God, remember to talk to God throughout the day and listen to God throughout the day. Make him your best friend throughout the day. He's always with you. As you do that, God will become more real to you. I hear it all the time, and I understand this because I, I get in this mode myself. But people say, I believe, I believe it's all true, but it doesn't feel real. God doesn't feel real. Jesus doesn't feel real. The Spirit of God doesn't feel real. Now, see, part of the reason for that, I think a main 
part of the reason for that is that we've got our real world over here and our religious world over here. We, we Western people compartmentalize everything. And so in the real world, that's my nine to five job. The real world is where I work on marriage issues. The real world is where I have sex. The real world is where I raise kids. The real world is where I fix garage doors. I try to fix garage doors. And then there's the religious world that I go to on Sunday morning and for 10 minutes before I go to bed at night. And never the twain meet. And since the real world is over here, that's the physical, tangible stuff, the day-by-day -day stuff, that's what our brain identifies as real. So, of course, God feels unreal. And the things of God feel unreal. And the way to make God real, to begin to experience God's reality, is simply to tear down that wall. Forget the compartmentalization. Forget the distinction between the so-called spiritual and the so-called secular. Make it all spiritual. It's all spiritual. It's all kingdom. God is present at all times and all places, and that makes every moment sacred. So remain open to God. And don't make it a separate religious thing, like you saw on the film there. Rather, just talk to God as natural as, as, as can be. And God becomes more, more real to you. Another thing that happens is you'll find that your, your capacity to love people grows. Your capacity to be concerned about people grows. As you're driving, or as you're shopping, or as you're walking the dogs in your neighborhood, bless people. Bless people. Uh, that's one of our most fundamental jobs as kingdom people. Just say a little prayers for people. Lord, bless that marriage. Bless, their, bless those children. Uh, bless their relationship with their dogs. Bless that house. Bless their finances. Whatever. Just bless people. Agree with God that every person you see was worth Jesus dying for. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's our most fundamental job. And as you talk to God about people that you are seeing and coming in contact with, strangers, um, you'll find that God begins to give you a little piece of his heart for them. And your capacity to care about strangers increases. We are all strongly conditioned by a very narcissistic secular culture where most of our attention is on ourselves and our immediate loved ones. And our, that diminishes our capacity to love like Jesus loves. But as you live in prayer and make praying for people uh, just part of your life, uh, it's, just a natural, it's just as natural as breathing. You'll find that your capacity to care and to love and to see beauty increases. You're becoming more of a kingdom person. Actually, you're becoming more of a human being. It changes the way that you look at people. It's just as natural as can be. The other night, my wife and I were out at Fleetwood Farms, and we're trying to pick up a, our Fleetwood Mac. or what, it's, it's one of those stores. Mills Farms, Fleet, Fleet Farms. Fleet, yeah, Fleet Farms, that's what it is. I get my rock music and shopping mixed up once in a while. <laughs> Clearly, I'm not the world's best shopper. And it was, uh, well, we're out there, and, and, uh, you know, and we're waiting for someone to help us find something that we need that I don't even understand. And, uh, but yeah, just, just use the time there. I'm, I'm there, so I'll just start blessing people. And it's just wonderful. Start blessing the, the strangers there. And you'll find your capacity begins to change. Uh, your capacity to love people begins to be, be modified. So, so God becomes more real to you. Your capacity to love becomes greater. Another thing that's, that can happen is you'll find you have more wisdom in life. The Bible says that if anyone lacks wisdom, and I'm thinking we all do, to ask of God and God will give liberally. And that same author, the author James, he says you have not because you ask not. When we live the, our life our, in the real world, in our sort of little bubble of self-consciousness, not including an awareness of God on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, not talking to God on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, when we live inside of our own little secular bubble, we are limited to our own wisdom about things. And yet, as children of God, we have access to the one who is infinitely wise. Isn't it smart to ask his opinion about some things? Now, I'm not saying about, you know, when you deciding what kind of cereal you should buy. You don't need to, you know, belabor that point. God, should I give you the Cocoa Puffs or the Wheaties? I just don't know. <laughs> but it is wise to say, God, lead me in your ways. If you've got something you want me to do, direct me. Put it on my heart. Or there's a decision you got to make or a problem that you got to solve. Just to talk to God who's your best friend and he's right there. He's always right next to your face, right there. He's looking at you. He stares at you with eyes of love 24-7. And, he, and, and he's inviting you to talk to him. So you just say, Lord, I really don't know what to do about this supervisor of mine who seems to have it in for me and, and is driving me crazy. What should I do, Lord? And then listen for a little bit. And you might find a little bit of wisdom from heaven coming your way. You gain in wisdom. Sprinkle throughout your life little short, common, natural friendship dialogue with God, with your dad. It will feel weird at first. 
Anytime you alter your normal, it feels weird. If you've been living life pretty much in a sort of secular little bubble of your self-awareness for all, most of your day, then talking to God feels kind of weird, especially if you're with your spouse and they're not used to you talking to God and you're with your kids and they're not used to you talking to God. And they're like, what are you doing, Dad? Well, okay, just start changing your normal. And it becomes normal after a while. It becomes pretty natural. Last night, my wife and I and some friends went to the Trans-Siberian Orchestra at Target. And it was an incredible concert. It blew me away. Over sensory stimulation. It was, it was marvelous. So we get home, and I'm dead tired. I mean, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm like in panicky, tired kind of thing. I'm laying down, putting my earplugs. Good night, honey. I'm going to sleep. And as I'm falling off the hill of consciousness, I hear my wife talking. <laughs> and I can't make out what she's saying, so I unplug my you know, earplug, and I go, Honey, are you talking to me? She goes, no, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm ta talking to God. And I'm going, oh, good. <laughs> I go, where's Lee? <laughs> Bless you, honey. She knows how tired I was. Uh, you know, tell him I said hi, all right? Uh, I'll, I'll see him first thing in the morning when I've got a little more consciousness going on. But that's just normal. It's just, just normal. Something comes to your mind, and, and you just intercede, and that becomes your new normal. And what a beautiful normal that is because that's a kingdom normal instead of the secular normal that, that we usually live in. A good book to get started on this. My small, our small group is, is, is uh, going to do a, a Bible study on this. We just ordered copies of it. But it's Brother Lawrence's uh, uh, book. He's a 17th century monk, and it's called Practicing the Presence of God. I've mentioned it a number of times over the years here. Practicing the Presence of God. There's a new translation out. That's a marvelous, uh, clear translation. And it's just talking about how to integrate an awareness of God's presence throughout the day. Think about this. In any moment, uh, to the extent that you're not aware of God's presence, to that degree, your awareness is not accurate. Because as a matter of fact, God is there. The most important fact about any moment is that God is there, and you're not aware of that most important fact. Right now, I'm aware that you're all here, and I'm talking to you. That's important. But the most important fact is that God is in this place. Right? God's right here, right next to my, my face. And if I'm aware of that, I'm including the most important fact of reality in my awareness. And now I can talk to God and, and uh, have this dialogue with him. Uh, practice talking to God naturally on a regular basis. Now let's look at the first two words of this prayer. This is this Our Father. Jesus says when you pray, pray Our Father. Or actually just Father. Matthew has Our Father. It was not without precedent in, in, in the Old Testament to call God Father. On occasion, Jews would call God Father. We find in the, in the, tr in the tradition that on occasion... Uh, the, the, the Jews would address God as Father. But it was rare. It wasn't, an, it wasn't the ordinary way of addressing God. And even when they addressed God as Father, it was usually Father of Israel. It wasn't personal Father. Jesus introduces a new Father concept with regard to God. In fact, he uses a different word for God. It's the word Abba. I'll tell you about that in a moment. Uh, in Mark chapter 14, it says uh, this. It records Jesus saying, Abba, Father. He said, everything is possible for you. This is when he's praying in the garden. So he says, take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Let your will be done. He calls God Abba, Father. Now the word Abba is not a Greek word. It's an Aramaic word. And it's a word of endearment towards your father. It could be translated dad. It's a term that denotes intimacy, closeness, vulnerability, uh, informality informality. It, it denotes a relationship with, with a dad that you do not fear, but you have a profound love for. Jesus calls God Abba Father, and that is a first in the, uh, uh, the tradition. It was carried over in the prayers of the early church. They even kept the same word, uh, 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 the same Aramaic word, Abba. So you find Paul saying this in Romans 8, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Far Father. The distinctive mark of the child of God is that you have a relationship with your father whereby you call him Abba. When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, genuinely surrender your life to Jesus Christ, the spirit of God takes up residency inside of you. And, and that's the spirit of sonship, Paul says. It's the spirit of Jesus Christ. So there now is an impulse in you that is driving out the ungodly fear of God, the terror fear of God. You have a reverence for God, but not that fear of going to hell thing any longer. No, that's pushed out. And now instead it's replaced with this 
Abba relationship with God. Dear Dad. This intimacy and this closeness. You find this also in Galatians chapter 4 when Paul says, Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your heart. That's the spirit of the son. And that spirit of the son calls out exactly what Jesus called out. Abba, Father. He gave us the spirit, and that spirit now connects us with the Father in the most intimate, dear kind of way. Jesus brought about an, a, 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 an intimacy with God and an informality with God that was absolutely unprecedented. And that undoubtedly is why the Lord's prayer here is so informal. It's, it, it's just perfectly ordinary. Gone is all of the superficial religious trappings. Why? Because we're not talking to the supreme being. Yes, he's the supreme being. But we're talking to dad. We're talking to dad. And we have this intimate, intimate relationship with dad. Where the, 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 there's respect for sure and reverence. But there's also this naturalness. And we just talk naturally to our father. Now some people, in fact a lot of people, have issues with the whole concept of father. Because it may be that in your upbringing, father didn't represent something all that beautiful. And there are people when you refer to God as father, there's buzzers that get set off. And the picture of God that they get in their mind when they think of God the father is anything but beautiful, anything but tender, anything but dear. And we need to address that. There's a young lady that I met when I was at Yale. She was in a psych ward. Uh, and I wasn't committed to the psych ward, but I, I, I had to do a little in, internship in the psych ward. And I um, just want to make cl- that clear. Uh, and, um, I mean, her whole thing was that she, she had a hatred for God, so she thought. Because she saw God as father, and therefore after the image of her earthly father, and her earthly father, as she told the story, was frankly something of a monster. Uh, making it all the worse was the fact that he was a head deacon in a church, was very religious, Bible-pounding, you know, wrath of God type of guy, but all the while would verbally abuse her, physically abuse her, and sexually abused her. And so understandably, her, 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 her associations with father were very, very negative. And so when she referred to God as father, all those associations carried over and polluted her picture of God. And she detested God. She said the only reason she didn't commit suicide was because she didn't want to give God the satisfaction of sending her to hell to torture her eternally ahead of time. He has to wait on that one. I mean, that's a pretty twisted view of God. Now, as I got to know her a little bit, what I learned was this, and this is true of a lot of people who reject God. She really wasn't rejecting the true God. She was rejecting a monster God. She was rejecting the monster God who was made in the image of her earthly father. And in fact, if you got behind that rejection of the monster God, you found a heart that was very tender and very open to God. Part of the evidence of that tenderness was that it was crushed by this monster view of God. Anybody with any sort of moral integrity who had the monster view of God would have felt obliged to reject that God. This lady actually was very open to God, but her picture of Father was just so jaded. And as we were able to work with her a little bit to give her a different picture of God that God has revealed in Jesus Christ, Uh, She was able to begin to uh, hesitantly uh, enter into a relationship with God. A lot of us have associations with with fatherhood that pollutes our picture of God. Part of what aggravates this is the fact that there's a long theological tradition where people aren't that sure about the father. Jesus, yay, he loves us, he's on our side. The father, I'm not so sure. And there's a whole tradition where, where, you know, the father, as Jonathan Edwards says, you know, he holds you like a loathsome spider dangling from a spider's web above the fire. And, and you are loathsome and despicable in his eyes. And, and, and you know, it's just his, his, his arbitrary mercy that keeps him from dropping it in. And he's just about to drop you in and then finally said, no, Dad, drop me instead. You know, take out your, your, your punishment on me. So God says, okay, you know, as long as you get punished, then that's be, I'll be all right. But he just assumed I've sent you to hell. It's like Jesus has got on the way. His wrath burns against you, so Jesus ends up saving you from the Father. And that's how it gets framed in a lot of theologies. Jesus saves you from the Father. So yes, you're really glad for Jesus, but the Father, mm, I'm not so sure about. And see, what we got to lock in here, folks, however you theologize this, Jesus doesn't save us from the Father. (laughs) Jesus reveals the Father. Jesus saves us from the devil. All right? Jesus doesn't... The Father isn't hidden, some terrorizing aspect of God hidden behind Jesus. Jesus says, if you see me, you see the Father. Why then do you ask, show us the Father? 
there, there isn't a schizophrenic deity, okay? Uh, you know, a good side and a bad side, and they're kind of at war with one another. No, God is one God, and Jesus reveals that one God. The love of Jesus is the love of the Father. The mercy of Jesus is the mercy of the Father. The grace of Jesus is the grace of the Father. Jesus' attitude towards you is the Father's attitude, attitude towards you. He's Abba Father. He's altogether lovely, altogether good, altogether holy. He's altogether in love with you. We've got to let that confront all of our, our uh, otherwise jaded views that we might have of God based on uh, our, our past upbringing. Here's a great passage that shows us something about Abba Father. Jesus prays this prayer. Listen to this very carefully. Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, which I think Jesus hopes that's the whole world eventually, and that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I have given them the glory, and the glory is just the shininess of God's character, which is centered on his love. I've given them the shininess of your love, the same one that you gave me, so that the world will know, Look and listen to this, the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. You've loved them just as you loved me. What is the love of Abba Father towards you? He loves you with the same love he has for Jesus Christ. In fact, he loves you with, in the same process of loving Jesus Christ. For when you surrender your life to Jesus, you are placed in Jesus Christ. In the process of loving Jesus with that perfect, eternal, unimprovable love, in the process of loving Jesus, he loves you. The same perfect, unimprovable love beginningless and endless, unwavering, passionate love that defines the triune God, the Trinity. The love of the Father for the Son is now that same love is directed towards you, which means God could not possibly love you more than he does right now. He could not possibly be more on your side than he is right now. Your earthly father maybe abused you, but your heavenly father, Abba Father, never would. Your earthly father maybe said terrible things to you and maybe terrible things about you. But your heavenly Father says in Jesus Christ, you're altogether lovely, you're spotless, you're my radiant bride, you ravish my heart. Your earthly Father may be abandoned you and left you high and dry, but your heavenly Father, your Abba Father says, I will never, ever leave you or forsake you. Your, 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 your earthly Father maybe loved you based on the, the, how, how much good you did and then took away love based on how bad you did and it was a performance conditional kind of a love, but your heavenly Father I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you're going through now. It doesn't matter what your struggles have been. I don't care how bad you've blown it in the past. His love for you is based on who he is and who he's made you to be and who he saved you to be and the fact that you're in Christ Jesus. He may not approve of all that you do. He doesn't approve of all that I do. But the reason he doesn't approve of it is because he knows we're better than that. And he loves us so much, he's against everything that, that tarnishes the beauty of that image, that damages us. He's against our sin because he's so for us. His love isn't based on how relatively good it's going, or how, and it's not taken away when it's going bad. Rather, it's unwavering, it's eternal. It's the love that he is. God is perfect, unsurpassable love. And now he's just being himself towards you. <laughs> All right, That same perfect, eternal, unwavering love. When we surrender to Jesus Christ, we participate in the love and the intimacy of the triune God. That's a beautiful concept. You lock that down, you're going to be free. The same love the Father has for the Son, he has towards you. The same love the Son has for the Father abides within you. You get wedged in between the perfect love of the Father and the Son, and that is the love of the Holy Spirit. Just like two healthy parents who are, who are in love, when they have a child, it expresses that love, and now that child participates in that love. It's like that child is wedged in between uh, the love of the, the, the husband and the wife. Not in competition, but rather as an expression of the love that they have. So also, we are incorporated into the love that is the triune God. We participate in his divine nature, it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, 4. That, folks, is Abba, Father. It couldn't be more beautiful. Could, he could not be more lovely than he is. Abba, Father. And Jesus says, Whenever you pray, he says, when you pray, pray like this. And we saw last week that the word when is hotan, which literally means whenever. So Jesus is saying, he's, it's not that we have to remember these exact words every time we pray, but th these are the main concepts we're to pray. When we talk to God, and Paul says we should talk to God continually, 
when we talk to God, remember who we're talking to. He's not some Zeus deity up in the heavenly realms. He's not some long-distance phone call remote God. He's not some Thor thunderbolt throwing deity from paganism. He's Abba. And Abba is right here. He's close. He surrounds you at every moment. He gazes at you with eyes of love at every moment. And he wants to talk to you throughout the day, naturally, as natural as breathing. He's closer to you than your own skin. He, he presses in on you 20 billion times more than the atmosphere in this room presses in on you. And he knows you better than, than you even know yourself, infinitely better than you know yourself. And he loves you anyways, because he loves you as you are in Christ Jesus, and he knows what you're eventually, eternally going to be. That is the God that you're talking to. And when you go grocery shopping and when you're driving on the street and when you're uh, at, at Fleetwood Mac store <laughs> and when you're watching the news and when you read the newspaper, when you're getting out of bed in the morning, when you're taking the shower, when you're going to bed at night, Abba is right here, right here, so close, so close. And he's saying, talk to me. Let's do life together. Let's do life together. Not some weird religious thing, just natural life together. This is the Christmas season. And it's all about celebrating God's closeness. Emmanuel, God with us. God becomes a human being. He's with us. This is what this prayer is saying to us. Talk to God naturally, simply, succinctly. He's always right there. I want to pray, and you can close your eyes if you want to, but you don't have to. <laughs> but look, at God's in this place right now, and I just want to ask, I just, oh, God. I'm begging you, God. I'm begging you. I'm only asking for this one thing. No, uh, the Lord's in this place, and I want to ask him to tell us right now what we need to learn from this message. Listen to the Holy Spirit. What are you supposed to take home from this? Will you let the Holy Spirit, if this needs to happen, put it on your heart to remember to talk to God throughout the day? Maybe start with one activity that you're going to include God in. Like driving home from uh, church today. Will you talk to God? Will you commit to that? And ask God for wisdom about how to do this. Maybe you need some reminders like post-it notes on your rearview mirror and on your refrigerator and on the door going out of your house and on the bathroom mirror and on the toilet seat. Wherever you're going to be looking, put a post-it note saying, talk to God. He's listening. He's listening. And just integrate your dialogue with God into every, every ordinary aspect of your life. Holy Spirit, give us wisdom about this. Give us wisdom about this. And there may be others here who really need to surrender their father concept over to God. Because it could be that's very polluted. And let the Holy Spirit just take that. Don't get mad at yourself for having it. That's not going to help at all. And don't get mad at your dad for giving it to you. It's, it's not, it's not going to help right now. Just quietly surrender it over to the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, show me Abba Father. Let Jesus Christ be my definition of God. Grow us, Lord. Make us your kingdom people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, 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 amen. amen. Praise God. And now, folks, we're going to transition to another time of worship. I want to call the ushers forward. Worship, we're, talk, we're, we're, we're singing to and we're singing about Jesus who reveals Abba Father. And worship is worship to the extent, get this, that our mind is here. In the present, we are focused. Throughout our ordinary life, we usually are thinking about 18 things, and we want to make God part of that. But right now is the time we set aside to be exclusively on Him. So will you make the choice to enter into worship fully and passionately and completely right here and right now? I've asked my friend Scott to come in and uh, start this worship set by ministering to us with a song, and the song is, appropriately, The Our Father. I had several people mention the, the song version of the Our Father and would like us to sing it. And I just thought it would be good to have Scott sing it here. And as he's singing, you think about the words. Make it your prayer. Let, let it saturate into you. We're talking about Abba Father who's right here. He's in heaven. He's on earth. He surrounds us at every moment. So Lord, be glorified during this time of worship as we honor you now by taking up this offering. And Lord, just bless Scott and anoint him in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>